What's up, you guys? Welcome back to The Connect. My name is Johnny Mitchell. As usual, please like, subscribe, turn on notifications so you get alerted whenever we drop new content. Follow us on Instagram, at Mr. Johnny Mitchell. And now, subscribe to the Patreon, patreon.com slash The Connect Show. You guys get access to all of the footage that we're not able to show on YouTube, and there's a lot of that coming. You get an extra bonus podcast episode every week, as well as behind-the-scenes footage. You get to participate in the live chats. You get exclusive access to merch when we drop merch. And you get a copy of my audiobook coming out very soon, Days of the Trap. Right now, it's the best way to support the show. $4.99 gets you in the door. Patreon.com slash The Connect Show. All right, let's get into it. You guys, before we get started today, I just want to wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving. This drops on Thanksgiving Day, so I wish many blessings to you and yours, and we're very grateful to have you tuning in and supporting the content. We're doing something a little different today. We are currently out of the country right now filming something for The Connect, something we think is going to be epic, so we decided to give a little teaser uh, for the Patreon members, if you subscribe to the Patreon, you can submit questions to me and different topics, and I will talk about them on the bonus episodes on the podcast. So that's what I'm doing today. You can submit questions to me. Go to patreon.com slash the connect show, and we'll talk about them. So without further ado, let's get into it. Hey guys, let me take a minute to thank our amazing sponsor, Canadips, the nation's number one CBD dip pouch company. You guys, are you still chewing tobacco like you're a baseball coach? What's going on here? You're spitting that disgusting shit all over the floor, all over the sidewalk. You're eating away at your lip, giving yourself cancer. You got to cut that shit out, okay? That shit is of yesteryear. You got to get on the CBD pouches. These things are amazing. CBD is good for everything. You can use it for sleep. You can use it for uh, recovery after working out. You can use it for energy and focus when you got to study or go to work. Got it in on the golf course when I'm in traffic as I, you know, write jokes. I like to use them for sleep, okay? I have a hard time getting to sleep at night. The CBD sleep pouches are amazing. And get this, they dissolve in your lip. So last night I had trouble falling asleep. I put one of these bad boys in. I went to bed in the morning. I woke up. It was gone. Right now, go over to Canadips.com and use promo code CONNECT, that's C-O-N-N-E-C-T, to get 30% off anything on their website. That offer is only good this week, so go over there right now, Canadips.com slash CONNECT, to get 30% off your order. Support them because they support the show. Now let's get back into it. Was it worth it? Yes, without a doubt. It gave me a lifetime of memories. It helped me become the businessman, entrepreneur that I am today. It gave me this risk-taking ability that I carry with me into the legitimate world. And look, I almost got away with what I set out to achieve, which is a uh, million dollars. I mean, I achieved what I, what I set out to. I made a million bucks. You know, I just fucked up and lost it all, right? But, you know, it was absolutely worth it. I only had to spend, you know, a year and a half locked up. So, you know, people ask me all the time, uh, was it worth it? Would, it? would it have been worth it to you to go back and do time if you could have kept all the money? I'd say absolutely. You know, if I could, if I could have a million bucks at 24 and go in and do 18 months and get out and, you know, have enough money to last me a lifetime, I probably would have done it, you know? So, yeah, it was definitely worth it. And it gave me all this you know, stuff to talk about, right? I've got this whole thriving YouTube channel now. Uh, some of my best jokes on stage uh, involve going to prison and being in the drug game. So yes, it was totally worth it. I can't say the same for most drug dealers though. And most criminals, I don't, even though they might tell you different, I don't think it's, I don't think it was worth it for them because a lot of them had to do a lot more prison time. You know, people selling drugs at my level, many of them got locked up and are still in there. Some of them are doing life. Uh, many of them got killed. So no, no amount of money is worth that kind of sacrifice for, for your life like that or for 20 or 30 years. But, you know, that's why weed was such a great business to get into in the era that I got into it because there was a high reward, high profit margin for 
little risk, right? So we're talking about a million bucks for a year and a half of my life. So yeah, yeah, no, overall, uh, it was definitely worth it. Ah, how difficult was it for me to find a connect? Well, it took years. It took years. If you go back and watch my videos, you'll see that I'm very open about how long it took me to make any kind of real money in the drug game. It, it takes the same amount of time uh, to make any kind of money in real business, five to 10 years. I mean, it's taken me almost 10 years to kind of break out and have some success in show business. And the same was true with selling drugs. I mean, I think I met my first grower, my first real connect that leveled me up in the game when I was 21, maybe 22. And, I, and by then I had already been selling dope, nickel and diming for four or five years. So I really put in my time. I put in my 10,000 hours, you know? And, you know, it, work is work. We, we worked, I mean, we hustled. Like we, we were out there scraping by, getting robbed, robbing people. You know, everything that came with uh, existing in the street, in the, in the muck, that's what we did. And we wrestled ourselves out of it. And look, um, you're just going to meet somebody. If you put your mind to something, if you say, we are going to find a drug supplier that's going to help us ascend in the business, you're going you're gonna to accomplish it eventually. But careful what you wish for, of course, you know. But uh, so it took a while. It's hard. It's hard. I mean, you know, with other kind of drugs... Right? Yeah, if you're into hard drugs, selling coke or, you know, heroin or anything like that, I mean, to, to finding a connect is, is extremely difficult. And uh, getting a connect in a source country is almost impossible, but can be done. I mean, I could get you a connect today if you wanted to meet me in Colombia. Not that I would do this, YouTube, but I, I you know, I could pick up and introduce you to somebody in, in Colombia tomorrow. Uh, so, Finding a connect is is not really the hard part. It's what to do with the dope once you get connected with it. Because you could buy five keys uh, in Medellin for you know two thousand bucks a piece, but how are you going to get those off? How are you going to make any money? How are you going to move them to the states? That's really uh, that's really what counts. So uh, you know, finding a connect is is pretty difficult overall. But anybody, any dealer can do it if they hang in there long enough or, and are able to save enough money and, uh, and avoid being arrested. What do I think about marijuana legalization? Well, it just depends on what perspective you're looking at it through. For most people, it's a great thing. It's long overdue, right? Um, it's great for consumers. You know, people, old people like my mother who needed CBD or, or, you know, gummies to sleep or for their aches and pains. It's great for cancer patients, everybody that needs pot. I mean, it's a very good thing. Um, it's even a good thing for people that want to smoke, right? I mean, it, it should be legal. It's a personal choice, right? It's like alcohol. Um, you cannot, they tried to prohibit it and it just made the mob rich back in the 20s, right? Same with weed, right? They made assholes like me and, you know, uh, cartels and all different stripes of criminals very rich for a long time so unfortunately because you know part of me still is that deep down I am still a criminal you know I'm and a hustler and, uh, and an opportunist uh, it's not so good for them it's not so good for the dealers right um, because I think you know as marijuana becomes federally legal you're gonna see a lot of private equity and you know big capital firms out of new york predatory capital firms really like monopolizing more than they already have uh you know the weed market like they've done with tobacco uh so you know i think it's just gonna push the little guy out even the little guy who's got a legit operation um will have a hard time competing with you know some of these bigger firms that will inevitably step in and buy you know all the acreage and all the greenhouse space and have all the capital to you know undercut people um so there's good and bad that comes with legalization obviously people are gonna have to figure it out like in california that's been legal for years but illegal weed still dominates the market because they're taxing it so much that it, it leaves open a space for the the black market for the for the dealers still which is a good thing um 
you know, it's, and we're doing an episode about this right now, the Sinaloa cartel, uh, 60% of their business before legalization in the United States was pot. It was exporting pot to the U.S., 60%. So for them, what they're doing now is they are reinventing themselves. They're, you know, have tons of legit grow ops all over Culiacan, which is the capital, and these different regions in Sinaloa, Mexico. And what they're doing now is they're growing pot that looks like it was grown in a greenhouse in LA. Fire! Just, you know, the best indoor grown weed, and they're distributing it in these dispensaries. And as a matter of fact, uh, you know, next episode, you're going to see what we're talking about because we're going to be down there filming and interviewing these guys. So even though it's been tough for a lot of people, for a lot of dealers, right? Um, and it's even put some cartels in Mexico out of business. Uh, you know, the big guys, criminals will always find a way. Drugs will always find a way. Life finds a way. So, um, you know, I think overall in the U.S., it's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's just, it doesn't really matter what I think about it. It is what it is. It's, it's, it's inevitable that in the next few years, it will pretty much be legal everywhere. And that'll mean people are getting out of prison. People will get criminal records. People that aren't really criminals, but got criminal records will get those wiped out and they can have access to credit and housing and, you know, perhaps things that they couldn't have, uh, when, you know, they got popped with weed. So, um, but I tell you, boy, I miss it. I miss the days when it was an outlaw business. I, I've said it before on this show. I wouldn't have done it if it wasn't illegal because half the reason I did it was for the rush, you know, was for the criminal identity. So, uh, but yeah, overall, uh, on a societal level, yes, it's, uh, it's a good thing that's becoming legal. And, uh, you know, uh, that's good. I'm happy. I'm happy for that. Should all drugs be legalized? Well, I don't know. I mean, it depends, right? Like in America, we don't do anything right that we set out to do. I mean, Europe has figured out a way to legalize most drugs, at least at a consumption level, right? Places like Portugal and Switzerland and Amsterdam. Um, but America tries to do that and it just opens the floodgate for, you know, all sorts of like petty crime, right? So in Los Angeles right now, you can't walk a block without seeing, you know, homeless cities and uh, people doing uh, drugs, you know, hard drugs and openly. And it just creates fucked up quality of life for ordinary citizens. And that leads to a lot of street crime and shit. So, you know, making all drugs legal and who's going to distribute these legal drugs? You know what I'm saying? The government? Because drugs won't stop. The government's going to make fentanyl pills. The government's going to uh, produce heroin, synthetic heroin. I mean, they probably have the capability to do it, but I don't know what that would look like. You know what I mean? So I think probably the way to do it is to decriminalize drugs uh, for using them. You shouldn't be you shouldn't be throwing heroin addicts in prison, right? Unless they've committed real crimes behind them. You shouldn't be putting junkies in prison. You should probably be putting them in rehab centers and shit. But keep it illegal. Keep it illegal. Let the cartels do their thing, you know? Because there's just they're gonna do it better than the government. Private business will almost always do it better than the government. So you know, even though coke is decriminalized in Amsterdam, let's say some of the biggest drug gangs, some of the biggest coke kingpins in Europe come out of Amsterdam now, come out of the Netherlands. So uh, yeah, I, I think if all drugs were to be legalized, I think that it would get pretty ugly in America because America doesn't really do anything right when it comes to radical social experiments like that. The only good thing we do better than anyone is make money. So I think that just like the Sinaloans who are making money selling weed legally but are still a cartel, I think the cartel will always adapt. So I think it'll be generations uh, before you see the cartels capitulate because of drug legalization. They'll, they'll be able to get their foot in the door somehow, you know? What was my biggest regret for my years in the drug game? Well, not getting away with the money. That was a, that's pretty high on the list, wouldn't you say? Losing all my money and going to prison, that was a pretty gigantic regret. Um, 
would have rather gone to prison and kept the money for sure. But yeah, it would have been being careless at the end, not hiding the money in the way that I knew it really needed to be hid, you know, keeping money in safe deposit boxes under my name. Like, come on, Mitchell, you know better than that. You know, I was way too deep and thorough to be making mistakes like that. So of course, yeah, no, I regret that a ton. I mean, um, not laundering the money uh, appropriately and not starting the laundering process early enough, you know? Like I talk about, I think it's the second or third episode where I explain money laundering and how, you know, individual drug dealers should begin laundering their money at the 50, 75, $100,000 profit mark because uh, they're, they're able, to, able to slip under the radar and just kind of grow it uh, and tr they're able to turn it into legitimate businesses uh, before they even get arrested. So, you know, and there's probably a ton of guys like that, really. I mean, there's, there's probably a lot of guys, especially, you know, boomers and things like that, guys who were of the Vietnam generation who got into hash and pot smuggling and even some coke uh, that probably made a bunch of money and rolled it over into legitimate businesses especially back then when it was just easier to hide all of that stuff. So that's really, that was my goal, was to turn my profit, my million bucks, into a whole empire of legitimate businesses. That's the real drug dealer's dream. The dream is to get out. That's the gangster's dream, is to not be a gangster anymore, as, I, as, I, as I've said. Um, so yeah, that my biggest regret was not seeing the end earlier, not not being satisfied with $200,000 or $500,000 and seeing what that amount of money could have done for a kid like me, right? I didn't need a million dollars. I didn't need $2 million. That was just extra. That was just greed. So, uh, but that's very common. That's, that's just the tale as old as time uh, with any kind of fast money. But that is, that is my biggest regret to this day uh, is, is not, you know, being able to flip that money into something legit. How did my years as a drug dealer help me in comedy now? Criminals and comedians are a lot alike, believe it or not. We have this angst within us, this dissatisfaction with society and the way things are. You know, we can't quite accept it, right? That's why I got into comedy, because I couldn't accept working a real job. I couldn't accept this kind of like nine to five middle class normalcy that, you know, I've saw, I've seen all my friends uh, who I grew up with kind of, you know, evolve into, you know, family men with square jobs. They got to go off every day to work and they kiss their wives when they get home and they go to their kids' soccer practices. Yeah, I grew up that way and uh, it always bored me. So, and that's part of the reason that I got into drug dealing in the first place was because it's a fuck you. It's a gigantic suck my dick to society. And every time you get away with selling drugs, you've beaten, you've beaten society. You've beaten all the laws and the police apparatus and the courts, which are society. You've beaten them because they throw everything at you to try to stop you and still you've prevailed. So, and a comedian feels the same way. He's up on stage and he's talking about everything that you're not supposed to talk about. He's giving a fuck you to the norms, to societal norms. And he's, you know, he's standing on his own. And that's kind of, I, I feel that the criminal uh, mindset is much the same. So I think, I think my criminality led me into comedy, A, because I discovered comedy while I was in prison, right? I discovered it was something I loved to do. B, uh, it created a fierce independence in me. Uh, getting rich at a young age, it created a, this desire in me to always be free. And, you know, back then I was free through money. That's what freed me. And today, you know, uh, money's still great, but uh, the freedom is in uh, the ability to get on stage and pretty much do whatever I want, whatever I want to do, as long as it's funny. Who is your favorite drug trafficker and why? Well, 
you know, I didn't know these men personally. I know many famous drug kingpins have done very bad things, so I can't really, I can't really co-sign a favorite. But you know, there's definitely some careers uh, that I've looked up to. You know, uh, Ochoa. Ochoa was the guy. I think Rafael Ochoa of the Ochoa dynasty out of Colombia, out of Medellin. Now, he was really the one behind the Medellin cartel. Most people think it's Pablo Escobar, right? They, they think it was Escobar. He was the front man. They say that it was actually the Ochoas that were the most powerful. And they were these oligarchs out of Colombia, you know? And old man Ochoa, big, fat, portly Ochoa. You know, he was a horse breeder, billionaire, businessman. But they say what propped up the fortune was, of course, he was one of the early uh, pioneers of the cocaine industry, of right? Exporting cocaine to the world market. So never did a day in jail. I, I don't know about his children. His children might have got into it thick and ended up getting killed and locked up like everybody else. But it would have been old man Ochoa, you know? And these are the days, these are the early 70s before a lot of the violence kind of really left like a stain on the drug traffic, you know? Because I don't like the drug, I don't like violence in the drug game. I I, uh, I never have. I've, I've always thought, God, there's got to be a better way to be able to sell drugs without, you know, committing horrific violence. I think there probably is, right? Um, but, you know, how else do you enforce when money is just out there with, with no contracts to legitimize it and somebody rips you off, how are you supposed to go collect from him, right? But uh, anyways, I detract. I say it's Ochoa. Uh, first in the drug, really, really pioneer of the Coke game, made billions, never went to jail, probably didn't have to kill too many people. So somebody like that. And of course, any anybody like, you know, my dad, my father, my lawyer father, has friends who were, you know, these big pot smugglers, right? These hippies turned pot smugglers back in like, you know, the late 60s, early 70s. And, you know, these, these guys got away with millions back then. And now they're, you know, big real estate guys and, and they own, you know, tons of different businesses. And they've been legit for years, but those guys probably never saw any time. Or if they did, it was very little. So anybody that fucking gets away with it, uh, on a uh, an independent level, and it doesn't have to be part of a cartel. Now, those are my favorite. You know, the guys you never hear about, really. Coming from a middle class family in Portland, Oregon, what made you want to become a criminal in the first place? Well, just movies, I would say, were the first thing. Rap. Rap music first, right? I'm a product of the 90s, right? 80s babies came up listening to gangster rap. Uh, Reasonable Doubt by Jay-Z, 96. I mean, the whole album is like this complete glorification of what I've been talking about, which is the street life drug dealer turned uh, legitimate mogul. You know, that kind of stuff just gives me the chills. It still does. It drives... You know, I'm more driven and inspired, even in comedy and show business, by rappers than I am by other comedians. Uh, the aspiration of it, the aspiration of it. And then, of course, Scarface and movies like The Godfather and, uh, you know, on a more hip hop level, Belly was a huge influence. Uh, movies like Paid in Full. Um, and it's funny because you see, you see how those movies end. Everybody ends up dead or locked up, but... You know, that didn't, we, we conveniently uh, blocked that part out. Uh, but, but deeper than that, it was, it was something in the spirit that I have, which is, you know, I don't follow rules well. I never have, never will. Um, I, I, was, I found the middle class lifestyle stifling and boring and repetitive and predictable. And nothing about the drug game is boring or stifling or predictable and the ability to take you know the drug dealer the criminal in general but the drug dealer specifically has their future in their hands right it's like Al Capone said the American dream is available to any man that's willing to reach out and grab it with both hands 
And that was attractive to me. You know, it still is. Uh, but with drug dealing, it was such an easy entry point, you know? It was such a, uh, it's, I love drug dealing. I love dope dealing. I love it. And I'll never apologize for it. I, it's the most pure kind of capitalism that exists. A supply that meets immediate demand. So those kids out on the, the corner on e, in East Baltimore or North Philadelphia or South Central Los Angeles uh, that are selling a crack rock or a dime bag of heroin and taking in the money off the street, it's, you know, it's kind of what America is built on, which is supposed to be business that is unimpeded by government. So that, I just thought that was cool. I thought it was amazing. How do you take this pound of weed? How do you take this block of cocaine and just go poof? And, it, and, and it's like the money, the money just comes to you off the street. You go to the street and the street pays you back. So uh, yeah, I think, I think it's a combination of all that kind of stuff. It was the, as soon as I found out that you could make a living selling weed, selling bud, selling pot. I didn't even know that you could get rich. Fuck all that. I just, wow, I don't have to work a job. I can just sell weed and live my life as a free man. Well, you know, that was attractive to me uh, from day one. Why am I not scared to talk about this? Well, a lot of people are scared for me to talk about this. Um, I'm not scared. Well, the statutes have long since run out, you know. Uh, I've waited over 10 years to talk about it. So legally, I'm in no kind of hot water. I, you know, seen homicides, been witness to crimes that don't have a statute. But there's nothing linking me. That You could send the DEA, you could send the FBI, you could send... Any kind of law enforcement body, you know, corrections officers to come to talk to me, I I will never tell, you know. Uh, and you, you, you can pin nothing on me. So that's why I'm not scared. And look, any kind of criminal element uh, that I used to deal with, whether you know, buyers, suppliers, middlemen, uh, workers, everybody's retired or they're dead or they're locked up. So uh, I don't see any real downside to it and people hit me up all the time i get a lot of dms uh from drug dealers you know you young kids out there make me laugh you say mitchell you're giving up the game what are you doing you're telling the secrets well just remember the game is to be sold so consider that i might be selling game you know what i mean so i think and plus you know the cops uh, i'm not to, i'm not saying anything new really i'm just saying it in a new way but you know the cops know all the tricks and, uh, you know, I'm not getting anybody in trouble. Uh, quite frankly, I, I'm proud of it. I'm proud that I was able to live this experience and come out of it alive without being a rat, without having uh, committed too much violence, right? I never had to kill anybody. I, you know, was involved in some, you know, ripoffs and stuff like that back when we were kids. You know, I'm not happy about it, but I've long since paid my debt for it paid my debt for that shit you know five times over so i don't know I, I i not only am i not scared to talk about it i think what i my goal is to inspire people it's to inspire people that were locked up like me or are hustlers like me maybe you had nothing to do with drugs hopefully you didn't right but you're a hustler and you want to become an entrepreneur and you want to create financial freedom well maybe you could you know, find that in me and use that as motivation to uh, to go turn yourself into a mogul or find something that you love to do and turn it into a business like I have, right? And and to let people know you can turn yourselves around. You can make, uh, it's not over for you. You make a couple of mistakes, you know, unless you're dead or you're locked up for life, um, You can, there's always time to bounce back. There always is. Making money is easy. I wish I knew back then what I knew now about how easy making money is. You know, you just put your mind to it. If you put your mind to making money, you will make money. Now, the idea to be happy is probably to make money at something that you like or that you love, but you can always make money. 
It's everywhere. They're, they're not stopping printing it, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, so I'm not scared to talk about it. Uh, I'm thrilled, and I'm thrilled you enjoy it. So many of you have reached out and asked me what my old partner in crime and best friend thinks about the show. He loves it. He is the best friend that a man could have. We are as tight now as we were back then. And he's just proud of me as he, as he always was. Um, it, uh, some of the episodes have given him PTSD for sure. You know, he remembers the days uh, that we took trips up the I-5 and we would get pulled over and, you know, time would stop and our hearts would speed up and, and, you know, we went into complete survival mode and that, you know, that scares the shit out of him. He says he gets a visceral reaction when he watches those episodes, but I think he, he uses it as a, you know, to go down memory lane. Cause just like me, he, man, he misses counting out stacks of cash and fucking watching those pounds move in the front door and leave out the back door, man. I mean, we pushed weight thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds, tons of weed. I pushed with that man. So, uh, no, I think he's very proud of me and I, I'm proud of him, you know? What is the future of drug trafficking? It's robust. It's robust. It's not going anywhere. If I were a Wall Street guy, I would be bullish on drug trafficking, uh, you know, especially with the youth. This goofy shit now, you know, fentanyl, MDMA, ketamine, uh, acid has made a huge comeback. You know, people will never stop getting high. Not until, not until they really fix what's going on, right, on a spiritual level. Not until society goes through a real revolution will uh, people be curtailing the use of drugs. Uh, not even cocaine is really going away, it doesn't seem like. I mean, every other day you hear about somebody... Uh, dropping dead from doing coke laced with fentanyl but you know uh the cartels continue to thrive you know sinaloa is stronger than ever uh colombia is exporting at record levels uh, you know pot is everywhere uh you know in europe hash is being brought in you know bringing billions of dollars a year to the moroccan and the spanish gangs so uh so i think it's robust i think it's uh, going to be here to stay uh, as long as you know depression and anxiety and pain internal pain uh, run rampant through the society right and uh, that's not going anywhere that's not going anywhere and there's a myriad of reasons I don't need to get into them about why the youth uh, feel so hopeless and so drained and so depressed and, and feel like their lives are so meaningless that they uh, just turn to drugs to numb themselves out. So, uh, you know, that's not going anywhere. So, uh, yeah, the future of drug trafficking is bright. What are the best drug markets now and what will be the best places to sell drugs in the future? Well, I touched on this in an earlier episode. Uh, best markets right now, depends what the drug is. But for cocaine, it is Europe and Australia because they are the furthest away from the source country, right? Colombia, Peru, Bolivia. And therefore, they fetch the highest prices. So the further away you are, the more risk you're going to have to take, the higher you're going to be able to charge people for your drugs. So, you know, Australia right now, I mean, every other day they're catching you know, barge loads, ton, multi-ton loads of coke coming in. Um, you know, I think they're even starting to send cartel submarines from Colombia now that can make it all the way to the shores of Australia. So, you know, the price there for a gram of blow is 400 bucks for one gram, right? That's insane. Compare it to Medellin, Colombia, uh, where it's going for like literally wholesale, I would buy a gram for $2 right? Try to wrap your head around that. Also, meth is huge over there in Australia, right? Uh, but for Coke, it's going to be, yeah, uh, the European countries, uh, Australia, and yeah, yeah. And, and in Asia, it's going to be methamphetamine. It's going to be speed, 
uh, you know, the Asian Triangle, right? Burma, Thailand, and I think, what's the other country? Lao. You know, they're producing more methamphetamine than they know what the fuck to do with. And some of the biggest, some of the biggest Asian drug gangs, you should look into this. I think it's called the Triad. Uh, those are the most fascinating gangs because the Asians got their shit together, boy. And you talk about a people that keep a low profile and don't talk a lot. Those would be the Asians. So they just took down one of the leaders, but they have one of the longest lasting drug kingpin legacies uh, in the world. So that's a fascinating thing that we'll probably try to get into a, at some point on the connect. Um, and then for pot, for illegal pot, uh, I would say it's a tough question because, you know, the Western societies are making pot legal, so it's it's a little harder to make money. I would say England for pot because high user base, the UK in general, uh, drugs are still all illegal there. I don't know why it's taken them so long to make pot legal, but uh, the price is high uh, the, and, and it's illegal, so... There's big, big money to be made selling pot in the UK. And, uh, you know, the rest, right? Fentanyl, that's a, that's an American phenomenon. I don't really think there's fentanyl anywhere else in the world right now. So, obviously, for the cartel, the best place for them to, to sell their fentanyl pills is in the U.S. Unfortunately, I think it's a very bad drug. I think it's probably fucking up the Coke game. But for right now, they're, they're starting to make a killing in uh, the U.S. and Canada pushing fentanyl to people. Okay, so you guys are asking me if I have an update on Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy, as you know, if you've been following the show, was my former cellmate and shot caller for the Hells Angels inside of Two Rivers Correctional Facility where I was locked up. He saved my life. He made sure that I made it out of there alive. I used to put in work for him, you know, smuggle balloons, collect cash for him. Uh, you know, he, he gave me my first prison shank. So Jimmy really, and most importantly, he inspired me to get out of the game and move to Hollywood and get into show business. Let's not forget that. You know, he was the one that really kind of like signed off on me when he saw me do comedy in, uh, in some of those talent show nights that we used to have. So uh, Jimmy, unfortunately, as you know, he ended up killing somebody in a prison riot at Two Rivers. Some guy stepped to him with a shank, one of his enemies. And he just laid him out, hit him with his fist, and broke the guy's neck. Uh, and they sent him to death row for that. So for the last decade since I've been out of prison, Jimmy has been fighting that. And, you know, they banned the death penalty in Oregon. And they were actually using his case as an argument to try to bring it back, which is total bullshit. Uh, but be that as it may, he's been kind of suffering on death row, fighting his case with minimal resources. You know, he's been relying on... Uh, public defenders to uh, kind of push his case forward. So, you know, I think Jimmy has probably not long for this world. Now, I know a lot of you have been asking us, how do you get a hold of him? You want to write him letters? You want to send him money on his books? You want to put money on his books? Uh, the thing is, we've, we've given him a fake name for a reason because, you know, some of the things we've said about him have implicated him in crimes, right? And although he is doing life, uh, I, he doesn't need another case on him, right? Because they're trying to, they're coming for him. So he doesn't need another RICO case. He doesn't need anything I've said to be used against him to get him in more trouble than he already is. So unfortunately, we're not going to give out his information on the podcast, but we really appreciate that you guys care about this guy um, because he is such a compelling character in the story of my life. And I owe him my life. And, you know, it's hard for me to even talk about uh but Jimmy is still currently on death row, and we are just awaiting that to be adjudicated. I, I'm quite certain that he will be found innocent, right? But, uh, you know, these things take forever, especially death row cases. But thank you for asking that. You know, we really appreciate it. And, I, you know, all you can offer is our thoughts and prayers for him and for people like him. You know, keep in mind, I've been writing letters to Jimmy for the past 11 years, and I've never heard back from him. And that's probably because he's being held in solitary confinement and gets moved prison to prison so often that it's just too taxing on him. 
And, you know, I, I think the guy may be losing his mind. I think that kind of torture, what that does to uh, a person's mind is like what, what it would do to any animal uh, when you isolate it from everybody else. Uh, it would just completely drive you insane. So uh, I don't know. I, or maybe he just doesn't give a shit. I, I, don't, know, I don't know what's going on with him, but, um, you know, it's concerning and, you know, it's probably indicative of the way that the system has finally broken him after all these decades. You know, Jimmy, Jimmy never let prison define him. He, he controlled his environment in prison. He, he was running the dope. He was running the gambling. He was paying off the guards. He was calling the hits. But just like any crook, he, he, he finally ran out of wind. So uh, I think your thoughts and prayers will have to do, but they're very nice, and, and we're glad that, uh, we're glad that you, the thought uh, is what counts. So we really appreciate that from you guys. All right, you guys, that's been today's episode. Thank you so much for tuning in. As always, like, subscribe, turn on your notifications, follow us on Instagram, and support the Patreon. I can't stress this enough. If you guys love the content we're giving out, the best way you could support the show is by subscribing to patreon.com slash the connect show. There's all kinds of content that we can't even show you on YouTube. You get to see it there exclusively there, and you get to get so many other cool benefits too. So go over right now, subscribe to patreon.com slash the connect for $4.99 a month for the price of a cup of coffee. You get so much content, uh, and we're really excited to, to bring it to you. All right, take care of yourselves. We'll see you next time.